you'll be turning in your Bibles to um, Hebrews 11, uh, we're going to be looking at four or five verses there uh, this morning. I don't know of a much better literary example of the destructive nature of fear than in Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. If you know the book, maybe you remember the story, uh, Crusoe, like almost the prodigal son, spurs his family and leaves on a great adventure to sow his oats. And as he's on a ship on a great adventure that he has laid out, the ship encounters a great storm, and he is shipwrecked all alone on a Caribbean island. And he begins to make his life there in his solitude. But he discovers, washed up in the floatsome and jetsome of the shipwreck, a Bible. And he opens that Bible and begins to read that Bible. And Robinson Crusoe comes to faith in Jesus Christ. And he becomes a very devout prayerful man. His faith blossoms under the light of the gospel. And even though he struggles with his loneliness, his faith grows and it it guides and directs him in so many ways. Defoe writes that Crusoe's peace How he prays and grows close to the Lord was overwhelming. That faith was planted in his heart and it began to flourish. But one day that all changed. Because one day, Crusoe was walking along his beach and he discovered a footprint. And in seeing that footprint, he realized that at some point, he was not all alone on that island. Once he saw that footprint, his mind went to the fact that within the other Caribbean islands, there were cannibals in that day. And he could just imagine himself being eaten. And Defoe says that that confident, peaceful, prayerful, faithful man became a fearful and scared man. He changed all of his daily routine out of fear that he might be discouraged. Fear gripped his soul. He lost his confidence in God. Defoe writes that all the former confidence in God which was founded upon such wonderful experiences as I had had, had vanished. God's goodness was gone. Well, as we look at the next portrait in our portrait gallery of faith that is Hebrews 11, we come this morning to the story of Abraham, a story that will take us the next couple of weeks to cover. And we have here captured great, great faith. But within the life of Abraham, we see the destructive nature of fear as well. 
Let's stand as we do each week, as we read God's holy word. Allow me to read from verse 8 through uh, verse 12. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as, an inheritance, as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. By faith Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Father, we pray that you would bless the reading and the hearing of this your word. Open our eyes, Lord, to see faith and fear as they really are. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Abraham's story takes up a good bit of Genesis. Uh, His story is not the longest story in Genesis. Joseph actually is. But from chapter 12 to chapter 25 or so, we have this life of Abraham. Abram, as he was called early on, Uh, I'm going to refer to him as Abraham the entire time. Um, His place in this portrait gallery looms large. It is hard not to take note of Abraham. So much of Genesis given over to him, mentioned so often in the Old Testament, mentioned by Jesus, Paul himself, dedicates the entire fourth chapter of his book to the Romans, letter to the Romans, to Abraham, coming right after justification. And so Abraham looms large over the all of Scripture. In fact, Paul calls him the father of all believers. Abraham is the first person in all of Scripture where God specifically commends someone for their faith, which is what this whole chapter is about, living examples of faith, where in the 15th chapter of Genesis, God writes that Abraham was uh, faithful and it was reckoned to him for his righteousness, credited to him for his righteousness. Our passage today gives a brief overview of of, uh, Abraham's life, and we're going to come back to that um, next week. Remember, Abraham, this long life that's detailed in Genesis, he's called Abram to start with, Abram meaning the father of many. You can imagine as Abram would meet people at the crossroads because where he settled in the land of Canaan was on a trade route and people would come and pay their respects. He was one of the richest men there were. The Lord had poured out his goodness to us. And he would introduce himself. My name's Abram, the father of many. And, oh, how many sons do you have? Well, none. Then almost... To add insult to injury, the Lord changes his name from father of many to Abraham, the father of a multitude. Wow, Abraham, how many children and sons do you have? Well, none. But he was faithful. He believed in God. And he took God at his word. Remember, God, Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees, and Abraham and his 
family made idols. Abraham was a pagan before God changed his heart. And Abram left everything that he had to go to a land that he did not know where he was going, but a land that God had promised him as his inheritance. Abraham was not worthy. He was just called. He was not a follower originally. God just wanted to use this everyday kind of guy to carry out through him his plan of salvation. Now this morning I want to break out a bit from our text and look at Abraham's life, uh, an incident in Abraham's life that is a great example for us of fear and faith. A time in Abraham's life where fear replaced his faith. <clears throat> God had promised Abraham that he would be the father of a great nation. That he would, in fact, you would not be able to count the number of his descendants. If you could count all the stars in the sky you might could count his descendants. If you could count up all the sand on the shore, you might could count his descendants. And yet Abraham grew older and older every year, and Sarah grew older and older every year. And the Bible tells us that Sarah was barren. So given the fact of this promise, Abraham, as he watched himself get older and older, and as Sarah watched herself get older and older, Abraham and Sarah decided that they needed to do something if God's plan was going to work. They were fearful that God had somehow promised this stuff in which they had believed, but somehow... God had forgotten them, or forgotten at least to tell them, that they needed to kind of help him out. And so this fear of not having children, this fear of Eleazar, his servant, being the, the recipient of his great estate and, and his line, this, this servant, Sarah and Abraham acted out of Fear, not faith. You remember the story. Sarah takes Hagar, her maidservant, and convinces Abraham, or perhaps they hatch the plot together, that God has promised us children and we're old. Let's help God out. Take my maidservant Hagar and See if you can have a child through her. Because God's promised us this, but I'm a little bit fearful that time is running out. Of course, you know, Abraham does that. Ishmael is the result of that union, and because Abraham acted out of Fear, because he acted foolishly, the consequences have lasted from that poor decision even to today. So let's look at a few for a few moments at fear and faith. Perhaps the most destructive little dirty secret that all of us as Christians have is that we do more out of fear than faith. Or we may dress it up and, and try to present it as faith, but in reality it's fear. Like Abraham, we often let fear rule our lives. <clears throat> 
Paul David Tripp writes powerfully about this very issue in his book, Dangerous Calling. He says, fear causes us to speak when we should be silent or to be silent when we should speak. It causes us to act when we should be patient or to freeze when we should act. Now, if any of us want to be honest with ourselves this morning, we all can relate to this. Fear of many different things. There are many moments in our lives when we act out of fear rather than faith. Now, let me say this. Fear is natural. We're created in God's image To have fear of God. When I say fear of God, I mean awe and wonder of God. But we let Satan so often scrub away our faith and let fear run rampant. Sin has corrupted that so that we so often flee to fear rather than faith. Now let me say this, fear is very real. I don't want to pretend this morning that it's not. Whether it's fear of the past, fear of the present, fear of the future, fear of ourselves, fear of others. Fear can sometimes consume our hearts. Tripp says this, fear can make God look small and your circumstances look huge. Now, I don't know any better way to say it than that. Fear can make you seek things from people that only God can give you, he writes. We fear people, we fear circumstances, we fear the future, we fear all of these things. Worry so often robs us of the joy that we have in Jesus Christ because we can't get past the worry about tomorrow. What is that doctor's report going to be? What happens with my job? What about my relationship or my relationship with my spouse or children or mother, father? Just fear of the unknown. I think it is reported that the biggest drug prescription that is written in America is for anxiety. How we deal with debilitating fear when it so often replaces faith is so important. I remember when my sister had a daughter, Laura, my niece, and Laura was born, as I probably have told you all before, born with only three of the four chambers of her heart. Her heart is backwards in her body. She only had one pulmonary artery going to one lung, not to both lungs. And it was touch and go with Laura for years. And in fact, she still lives with doctors on a constant basis. And I've seen in my own family how often the debilitating effect of fear over faith when it's your child or your spouse or your mother or your father or something else. How do we overcome fear and rest in faith? And again, we go back to Abraham because Abraham walks us through how we push fear away and live out our faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Yes, he let fear overwhelm him. 
You know, one of the things that I so appreciate about the Bible is the Bible does not sugarcoat believers. Noah was a drunk. Verse 7 is about Noah. His portrait hangs in the hall of faith. Abraham let fear overrun his faith. He has a great portion here. He talks about Isaac and Jacob that we'll talk about in the weeks ahead. Hardly stellar models for us to hold up at certain points of time. And so you, if you have let fear overrun your faith, take heart. Because Abraham helps us to understand. God does not want us to live in fear. He promises joy, peace, and satisfaction, not worry and fear. Psalm 37, 8 says, Do not fret, it leads only to evil. In Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about not worrying about tomorrow. That God's got it. No matter what the outcome. God already has it. So what did Abraham do? Well, if you study in depth his life, we know that once he realized his mistake, once he realized that he had let fear overrun his faith, he went back to meditating on God. He went back and began to once again appreciate the character and promises of God. Abraham realized that even though he lived between the tension that he had no children and that God had promised him children, that he needed to abide in Christ in that tension. That he needed to be patient with God. He kept his faith. He went deeper and deeper with God. Romans 4 tells us that he knew both his bar Sarah's barrenness and God's promises. And he grew deeper in his faith, finally deciding to be patient with God. Now, let me be the first to admit that waiting is one of the hardest activities we all do. Waiting for that phone call, whether it's about a job or whether it's about a medical test or whatever it might be. Waiting is hard. Being patient is difficult. Not letting fear of the unknown rule over your faith is hard. But God has promised to be with us. Even when we spend our time and mental energy on worry. God has ordained all that shall come to pass. And yet we worry. And yet we grow fearful. Always concentrating on your circumstances will, as Tripp said, make your circumstances huge and your God very small. So how do we get away from that? How do we go into a different direction? How do we stop playing the what-if game? You wouldn't believe how many people I talked to who come in and, and we're chatting or I meet out and about and they talk about worrying about what if. I've played that game. I'm sure you have as well. What if it's this? What if it's that? And our mind runs in a million different directions, none of which are usually very positive. Well, how do we meditate more on God. How do we not question the future and not doubt God's providence? 
when you meditate on Jesus Christ, when your meditation on Him is greater than your meditation on the fear and what if, faith will conquer over fear every time. Tripp gives four ways that we deal with this. He says, look, own up to it. Admit that you are afraid. Read the Psalms. David is like that. Confess, he says, when you're fearful. Look at your worship, he says. Let me pause just briefly on that one. I can't tell you how many people have through my years in ministry, not come to church because things weren't going well for them. Now, that might seem completely wrong on the surface, but we all have experienced that, haven't we? How is your worship life going? When you're in a fearful situation, when fear begins to overrun your faith, look at how much time you're spending on God. Let that be greater than the amount of time you're spending on fear. And lastly, he says, preach the gospel to yourself. We forget this as believers, some of us longtime believers, we forget to preach the gospel to ourselves. That gospel that says God loved you more than anything in the world and sent his son to die on the cross to forgive you of your sins, including your worry. And that he holds tomorrow for you. He who loves you more than anyone else in the world more than you love yourself, holds your future. Where can worry be in that scenario? When we worry, we doubt God. But when we let the awe of our great God overwhelm our lives, when we meditate on Him, fear vanishes. Faith is restored. We are once again centered in Christ and we can live out that faith and abandon that fear. Amen.